When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only I am certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived, like a baby, by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits, and if the latter be so, I need and shall need all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the grey door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there are no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door, laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these manual offices, surely this proved that there is no one else in the castle. It must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did, by only holding up his hand for silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix? of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash. Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavour and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help. Is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that it is a medium a tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort. Some time, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight he may talk of himself, if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. English lawyer Jonathan Harker journeys to Can Dracula's Transylvanian castle to discuss a routine real estate transaction. Title deeds are the last thing on the shape-shifting Count's mind. He has a thirst for pastures new and fresh blood, and as the action moves to England, he gorges himself at the expense of the unfortunate ship's crew. Harker's fiancée, Mina, her friend Lucy Westenra, Dr. Seward, and vampire expert Professor Van Helsing band together to stop the undead count from rising. Only certain weapons will be effective, and not all of them will survive. Told through the diaries and letters of the chief characters, Dracula has a gripping authenticity and immediacy that draws the reader into its shadowy nightmare.